Now this is this is titled, as you'll see from your your guides, fake you news in the London in the bubble. Right place. Oh, it's there as well. Let, yeah. Have a seat. Have a seat. I just, I, I, I just, because back to the name pronunciations, I once oh, uh, on. went to a uh, conservative association dinner. I wasn't the guest of honour, so it wasn't quite that bad. But when I got there, the name place on the, uh, on the, di on the, on the table where it said Tessa Jow. <laughs> and, I, I, and, I, and I just thought, well, does everyone not realise that, you know, you're not even a Tory? I mean, but, uh, um, but anyway, um, so it happens all the time. But I my bro my brother-in-law, by the way, is uh, Geoffrey... Joel, so you could have had him this morning, Joel. and then you could have had Joel. your, Stole. you could have had Joel and Stoll. And, and how? And you'd, have I, to, I, you'd have to have had a, ch he's a human rights lawyer, so. <laughs> I'm just going to stick with Tina and Tessa. I think there we are, now. okay. <laughs> Um, so you we wanted the long answer. We will talk about <laughs> fake news. We will talk about the notional London bubble, uh, whether it's notional or, or a reality. But we, I think we can all agree that it's been an extraordinary almost two years politically now uh, since Brexit. And we are facing, uh, in a, just under a month, um, a general election. And uh, Tina, you wrote a very interesting piece post-Brexit in The Telegraph, I think it was, about why you felt that Brexit had happened and, in a sense, what you felt it exposed. Just elaborate on that, if you would. Um, well, I think, for me, I think it's really important for us to remind ourselves of, of some basic uh, things. And, and sitting here, um, I mean, yes, I'm a member of the House of Lords, and yes, I'm uh, a Tory, and I'm not here <coughs> to sort of tell you anything that you don't know. I think that, you know, we are all very much, to coin a phrase, in this uh, together, for those of us who I describe sometimes as you know, part of the in-charge class. And, um, but for me, I think, you know, Brexit exposed a division. It really didn't create one. It exposed something that was already there. And um, what I think is uh, essential for us to concentrate on is bridging that gap. And I think that gap is, and bridging it, is as important as any um, deal that the Prime Minister does or doesn't do uh, in the negotiation of, uh, of, of, uh, of the way in which we leave the European Union. And I think what, um, what's important for me is that um, to, uh, to remember that when, um, when you look at the evidence, a lot of ordinary voters, when they uh, voted to leave the European Union, were not really thinking about Europe at all. They decided that it was something about something else, and, and you know, I mean, basically, sort of the question that they thought they were answering was, um, "Do you think everything's all right?" And their answer to that was, "No, not really." Um, so, if we're going to bridge that gap, uh, because I think we need to do that if we are to have some stability in the future for everybody, we need to recognise those of us, people who do jobs like those of us here in this room, how we contributed to causing that gap and then think about, well, what is it we need to do differently to stop bridging that gap? So that's, that's very much where I think about it. And Tessa, do are. you believe that that gap uh, exists in, in a real sense, particularly between people who aren't politicians and people who are the in-charge people, as, mm. as Tina describes them? I think I, I very much agree with, um, with Tina on this. I was an elected representative for 23 years. Um, as the Member of Parliament for Dulwich and West Norwood, um, which happened to be a constituency that voted uh, by 70, 79% of people who lived there voted to remain. Uh, and in the 23 years that I served my constituency with weekly surgeries, nobody ever came to see me to say the problem is our membership of the European Union. And you know, I hope that you're going to stand up in Parliament and say that we ought to stand up to them, we ought to, uh, we ought to leave the European Union. So I think Tina is absolutely right that um, Brexit became a proxy. And it became a proxy that divided the country. And I think it's very easy to understand the, um, the sense of disconnection um, helplessness uh, and sort of envy um, of those parts of the country where everything seems to happen, except it's not true. There are huge levels of poverty in London, which is not glittering um, bright lights. Um, but it is a sense of disconnection. And uh, Brexit became a proxy 
or, if you like, a receptacle into which all that fury could be, uh, could be located. But I, I know, Tina, you, you believe it, it exposed decision, uh, divisions, exposed some decisions, all right, it exposed divisions rather than uh, caused them, created them. Yeah, no, I do. I, I mean, and I think that, I mean, we're both agreeing that, uh, that nobody up until um, that referendum was asking for us to leave Europe. I mean, I think, I think the other thing which is, you know, as politicians, and I include myself in this, um, went into the referendum. I, as I say, this is, you know, I can't speak for Tessa, but I know this is how I did it. I, I went into that referendum thinking that um, because people generally are not interested in Europe, it's not on the top of their uh, agenda of, of things that matter to them, that, um, that you know, the, the, the kind of campaign that... Um, unfolded where you know the risks of leaving would be exposed would be good enough to convince them of um, of the reasons to, to remain in, in, in the European Union but because of um, the way in which both campaigns conducted themselves you know both leave and, and remain and uh, and there was a, you know all of this you know sort of lots of facts being thrown around I mean we've talked about fake news and facts already this morning but um, lots of facts being sort of banded around where in the end, ordinary voters thought, well, do you know what, I can't, I can't tell the difference between either of you anyway. I don't know, you know, I think it, it's a false sense of security for those of us who were on the Remain side to believe that what was on the side of Boris's bus, you know, swung it for, for anybody, because we were, you know, as bad ourselves in the way that we packaged up our own facts. It's, it struck me that the, loser, the losers didn't expect to lose and the winners didn't expect to win, and their campaigns reflected that, it seemed to me. And I think that uh, the problem with the Remain campaign was that it wasn't a hungry campaign. It wasn't emotional. I, no. And I campaigned in 1975 um, in the first referendum. It was a hungry campaign. And I think that that was the difference. And actually, I just really want to say this very quickly. I think that the ways in which, when we were in government, we sort of felt this sense of dis d division and disconnection. And we did things which... Uh, made a lot of difference. And the great sort of tribune of this, in many respects, was John Prescott, because John Prescott just felt it. He just felt it. And so New, New Deal for Communities, the scale of investment in schools, it's uh, the, the investment in roads, you know, many parts that voted to leave are so disconnected. Um, and th th this was what made a difference. And, and feel that nothing well, is happening for them. Exactly. And so the, the answers are prosaic. You know, uh, I mean, if you look at the list of 10 projects that the National Infrastructure Commission are going to prioritise and, you know, press the government to act on, they're very prosaic, but they're incredibly important. And the, if they all happen, they'll change the country. And so I think that's what is so frustrating, that we're going to le lose something so precious about our country, and it's just a bit of a mistake, but, if only we'd done better but, on addressing the underlying causes. But I think this is where we do part company, and we are saying something different, because what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the voters, because they couldn't make sense between leave and remain, and I don't think the problem was that you know, the campaign wasn't emotional enough, the voters, ordinary voters, made this a decision on something completely different to Europe. Well, no, and for them... Just forgive me, the Leave campaign was emotional. The Remain campaign was dry, arid figures. Yeah. The Leave campaign was full of Britain and full of optimism. I didn't yeah. agree with it, but it was full of Britain and full of patriotism. supposed optimism and patriotism and, patriotism and yeah. the, you know, Sonny Uplands or whatever he was on about that day, Boris Johnson. Um, it, but... It, but the, the Remain campaign was not. That's what I meant when I said it wasn't an emotional campaign. It, it was relying on us presuming we'd stay in the EU. And the Leave campaign and, and their voters were passionate about getting, most of them, passionate about getting out of the EU. And it was that passion, it seemed to me, that swung in. But, um, but my, the bigger point I'm trying to make is that in the end, the majority of um, ordinary voters who did not think this was about Europe but voted uh, about uh, used it as a proxy, did not think it was, uh, did not, uh, were not motivated by whether or not we should stay in or leave the European Union. For them, what they really did connect with, I mean, this, this, this phrase of take back control, mm. which is something that I do think was very powerful, but for them, they were taking back control for themselves as people, not transferring power from 
Brussels to Westminster. And I think in this stage of the process now, where uh, Parliament, both houses, have um, not been as smart as they needed to be over the period of the result and um, the Prime Minister decided to call a uh, general election, is recognising that we, all of us, we're not in charge of the agenda right now. The agenda has been set by the people uh, forcing us to leave the European Union. And when we think about the general election, we need to sort of, yes, it's all about Brexit, but it's about the causes of Brexit, in my view, not about the European Union. You see, I, I, I'm, uh, I think we are uh, um, getting two points of difference between us, um, Tina. And I think that there is... Um, that uh, there is an acquiescence rather than leadership. And I think that... Uh, on whose part? Theresa May's? On to, yes, I mean, uh, on the government's, Theresa May's particularly. I think that conceding um, right at the beginning that we were going to leave the customs union and the single market when a few months before the, uh, the, the Conservative election manifesto had committed to staying in the single market is just not plausible. And it's put us in a very weak negotiating position. And I think that you have to negotiate in Europe to understand the nuance, the subtlety and the scale of the challenge of negotiating in Europe. And I think that that's, I don't think David Cameron did it, and I certainly don't think that Theresa but May has on, done it. On my programme, we talk about Brexit a lot, as you can imagine, and an awful lot of the callers who are pro-Leave, who, who voted Leave, they, for them, leaving the EU just meant leaving the single market. It meant leaving the customs union. It meant leaving the ECJ. That's what it meant to them, and that they are setting the agenda, and they are. Well, you see, I think, I think that a lot... She's listening, is how they might view it. Yes, but, I, you know, I mean, I like to think that I've, you know, talked to a lot of people about this in Brexit areas, and, you know, what, what do they want? What does take back control mean? It means that there are enough places in the local primary school, that they're not having to wait to get a GP um, appointment, that their kids in school you know, have a chance to get on. And you say that's uh, fixable within the EU? It's absolutely fixable. I mean, it's fixable by a responsive and a reactive government that understands that government can have a strong and purposeful role in reshaping and the country in a way that, you know, not even just partnerships with business or the voluntary sector can possibly do. You've talked about bridging that gap. Um, just a sense from both of you as to how you go about bridging that gap between, broadly speaking, the electorate, those who uh, are not in charge and those who are who are slash were in charge? Well, um, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, the last thing I want to do is, is to disagree with, with Tessa. And, 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 I do, and I don't want to, I, and I, I mean this really sincerely, I, I don't want to turn this into a you know, partisan political. So anything that I say which is um, supportive or, uh, or positive about Theresa May, I'm not saying it because I'm trying to make a political uh, point. And, and it's worth remembering that, um, you know, I'm not beholden to Theresa May because she relieved me of my responsibilities <laughs> last July. So, um, so, uh, <laughs> but, um, so uh, but I think what, um, you know, we have, to, we have to acknowledge that when you look at the polls, um, Theresa May is very much out there sort of in front as far as um, trust of her amongst uh, ordinary voters. And, and it strikes me, I mean, one of the great benefits of being relieved of my responsibilities last July is that I've had an awful lot of time to think about things, which um, I didn't get the chance to do when, um, when I was doing such a big job uh, before. And when I, you know, I mean, I, as I say, I was part of the Remain team and, uh, you know, and I, I really sort of thought, you know, what has happened here? What, what, what's gone on? And the image that, that always struck me when I sort of thought about it was that, you know, this chasm has been exposed. And although, you know, for simplicity, we might sort of say on one side it's, it's leave, or the other side it's remain, but it's not like that. I mean, I think that a lot of people who um, voted uh, remain, you know, would have perhaps voted um, sort of leave, you know, they were, as I say, because I don't think it's really about, about Europe. Now, Theresa May supported remain, but what Theresa, I think, has successfully done is she has, by continually saying Brexit means Brexit, you know, I mean, I know we sort of laugh about all of this uh, stuff, but she has, um, she's crossed this chasm. She's moved over to the other side. 
And what I feel she's done is she's kind of volunteered herself as hostage to people on this, on this other side and said, I'm going to deliver you the change that you wanted by and, and used Brexit as a means towards. And, um, and so what I think the rest of us have got to do is find our own way of getting over to that other side. Because one of the, when we had the debates in Parliament about the Article 50 bill, and I spoke up against Parliament giving itself the power to have a meaningful vote at the end of the process, the reason I argued against Parliament giving itself that power was because I felt we as, as, as Parliament needed to acknowledge that you know, this decision has been made. We are coming out of the European Union. We need to make sure that qualified people, professional people, whether it's in your industry or anywhere else, get the opportunity to influence the government as they are negotiating over the next couple of years. But we need to make sure that we do that in a way that starts to, 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 to allow those people who no longer have confidence in us to start to build confidence. Is and I think Theresa is one of the few politicians, as I say, whatever you might feel of the Tory party or indeed of her, that has made, has made that transition. But, is it, but you regard that transition as an act of courage, as a sort of crossing the Rubicon. You regard it as an act of acquiescence. And that's... That's the big difference, and and I, I, my guess is that most voters will fall behind either of those two camps. If you see what I mean, and th that gap is still there. And how, yeah. as politicians, it, it, do you bridge it? Well, I mean, the the, the problem. Uh, I mean, the, the the first problem is that it was only the Supreme Court that put Parliament back into the process. It was a citizen taking exactly, the government to the and we are a parliamentary democracy. We are a representative democracy. Every single member of parliament is elected and sent to Westminster to represent their constituency. And somehow, uh, you know, given the narrowness of the vote, and I'm not saying, well, you just say it was all a mistake and we don't do it. But, you know, if it, the, the intelligent way to, to, to proceed is to keep people engaged in the process as we go along. People were asked, a simple question, do you want to leave the European Union? What people are only now discovering is what the consequences of that are. So I think that there, I mean, I think this was a failure of Parliament at the time, that there should have been um, a, a clear threshold uh, for a major constitutional um, decision like this. And I think also there should have been provision for people to be given um, a second vote um, once the nature of because the deal of the and its decision. consequences are clear. And so quite apart from Parliament having a meaningful vote, which is, of course, Parliament should be able to vote on the final deal. So too should the British people have been able to. That is not unpicking the authority of the Brexit decision. It's simply having a more efficient, competent, proper way of dealing with, the, uh, de dealing with this cataclysmic process. Part of any political communication or advertising communication is about um, landing the message, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but with so much around us about, about fake news and so, uh, so much less trust, it seems to me, in politicians from voters, certainly a lot of the people I speak to on my programmes say as much, um, how do you, you and other politicians, how do you modify your means of communication to regain that trust because well, okay, before you before you answer yeah, sorry. can i just say that having interviewed tessa many times you were, you were not one of the offenders of a, of a political practice i'm about to describe but you you do communicate clearly as as a, in, in all the interviews i did i felt i was having a genuine conversation but so often with particularly politicians the higher up the scale they get you begin to have a ludicrous conversation mm. that they will not let you have a conversation mm. and and journalists then have to find tricks and ways of getting around this strange manner of communication we're seeing it in this election campaign mm. and trust me it's cynical mm. it feels cynical it sometimes even feels sinister I know mm. I've used that word twice already today but uh, how, how do politicians modify that approach so that they feel and actually not feel, are authentic to the, yeah, to the well, voter. Yeah, well, I agree with you about that. And I think, and I've really thought about this a lot, and I, I think there's a lot of political communication phrases. Tina and I, I'm sure, could sit here and deliver. Um, maybe you forget everything that we said anyway, but that we were, the kind of white noise of political 
you know, prior, you know, settings, you know, my, I, I would say, and, you know, anyway, but I mean, we'll go on and on about the white noise of political communication. I think you can only challenge that um, as somebody who um, is elected or appointed, as Tina and I um, both are, by engaging constantly with the people whose lives, In their um, lives you want to change. Exactly. And I think the best, you know, just always know what poverty smells like. Just always see the disappointment in the eyes of a 10-year-old boy that he knows that somehow, you know, he goes to school every day, but he's not going anywhere. Just see the face of an ambitious, I used to see them every Friday, the school gate, an ambitious um, second generation Jamaican mother who knows now that her seven-year-old reads better than she ever can. And I think, you know, that if what you do is driven by that, then you're in with a chance that you can somehow reflect back your commitment to, in your to that humanity. Yeah. And not just in your communication, because this is not about the dreaded forms of words, you know, which are death to good politics, but confronting the pain and the disappointment and the excitement and the optimism, this whole range yeah. of what real people feel in their lives, and then creating this golden thread, which is the big strategy and then the good policies that reflect that? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's all about uh, motives, really, in the end. And uh, I, I mean, I had the uh, opportunity to hear the sessions that went before uh, this one, and I know uh, Tessa didn't. But I mean, listening to the debate about uh, advertising or listening to um, the uh, presentation from uh, Bridget uh, Anger uh, about strategy, I mean, I think what, um, what people are looking for from all of us, whatever it is that we're trying to communicate, you know, whether it's as politicians or whether it's as businesses or whatever, is um, clarity uh, and uh, simplicity around how we describe the motivations for what we're trying to do. So you asked me uh, a few minutes ago, Sheila, how we can help bridge this gap that I say has been exposed by... Um, by, by Brexit. And I think when we come to think about how we do reconnect with people, we do need to recognise that, that where, where I think they feel there is no longer that connection is around behaviours and attitudes. And we are living in an increasingly complex uh, world, and we heard that about sort of the way in which advertising is uh, now happening on the internet. But I think all of us, if we remember that what really will move people is, is understanding our well, motives for what we want to do. And if they believe that our motives are sincere <coughs> and they share similar motives, that's when we start to, I think, uh, bridge that gap. And it, they often don't believe it. Um, again, I'm basing no, this on exactly. 15, 20 years of speaking to people on the radio every day. But they, they often don't believe it. And having worked a lot in Westminster myself and met, met you all as yeah. individuals, as people, I, I do take the time to remind them that that most of the MPs I've ever met, most of the people at, at, at your levels of public life are, are motivated in a good way and that they can be reassured by that. It doesn't mean everybody is. Sometimes it's ego, sometimes it's power, whatever, but, but power is important, you know. So I, I remind them, but you've got a long way to go. But, but do you know what, Sheila, you were so right. We do, because, you know, I mean, Tessa was a, an MP. I've never been an MP. And she's got far more experience of spending time with constituents and, mm. and getting to understand their problems than I ever did. Um, but I, what I'm talking about is, is something which is a bit different. We talk now as politicians about what we're trying to do. And we try and connect with people by saying, we feel your pain, this is our solution. But we don't give them, we, we really don't do as much as we need to to understand why they are so. Um, uh, uh, disenchanted and so frustrated with us as, a, as an in-charge class. And until we start to understand that and then express our motives in ways that properly connect with them, we're not going to connect. We're just not going to do it. And so I think as an interview on radio, if I ever do have the great opportunity to visit you on LBC, then you know, the thing that I would, you know, feel that you had every right to push me on all the time is why do I want to do what it is that I want to do? Because that's what people want to know. And that's not what, uh, we are nowhere near as good as we need to be. 
And just before I finish up on this session, I wanted to ask you, Tessa, in particular, about uh, the notion of fake news, mm. um, because you've you've given lectures on it in Harvard, no less. Um, was Donald <laughs> Trump listening? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Um, it's not new, is it? Really, fake news. No. It's come. It's expressing itself in a different way, obviously. Yeah. That, but uh, um, no, it's uh, it's not new. It, I mean, there there are so many things that are shaping um, this. Uh, but sort of confuse political cataclysm at the moment, which are not new. But lack of trust in politicians is not new. Politicians have never been trusted, which I, is why I mean, I'd love to talk more about this, um, this uh, uh, about how you confront that. And it is difficult. You've got to have grit under your fingernails. But um, fake news is not a new uh, is not a new phenomenon. But if you uh, build your understanding through you know, hundreds of conversations, you can begin to build uh, your own truth that you then reflect back to the, uh, the people that you serve. And, and, and sorry, I, yeah, well, I did just want to say one other thing, which I think is, um, you know, given a, a, such a, a kind of, sort of sophisticated audience as this, that I think it's worth looking um, you know, we're rather obsessed by Donald Tr Trump and his politifact analysis of pants on fire um, inaccuracy. But it's now worth looking at um, the new alt-left. You know, this guy in um, Another Angry Man, I think, is, is his, you know, who's every, every week now is getting more um, reads of his blog than The Guardian does. And so... You know, I feel I've run to keep up with this, but you know, many of you will be ahead of the curve. But I think that we have to tolerate not understanding and not killing this, what could be a very creative moment, by imposing um, a rather unsatisfactory form of words, mm -hmm. which is the great uh, scourge of good politics. And, and actually, I said final word for you, but Tina, you and I were talking before we came on stage about. Um, the fact that when I have conversations and, and bring facts to the party and say, no, I'll tell you why that isn't true, because blah, and, and people are, if they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it. They're very resistant to exactly. a fact if they don't want to hear it. And you made the very important point that actually you can drown them in facts, but you've got to make them feel something exactly. about it. Well, I mean, exactly. I think, I think you know, Tess is right that people have uh, mistrusted politicians since the year uh, dot. It's also true to say that um, for a long time, um, people didn't really understand what politicians would say, you know, would come on and sort of talking about, and I'm talking, I'm going back, you know, decades here. The difference is they didn't mind not understanding when the system worked, okay? When the deal, when the social contract was, was okay, to them, it was fine. Now they are, they want to understand because it's not working. So, so you know, we have we have to understand why it's not working for them. Not just give them more facts as to why our system, the problem, as in you, you know, the reason why you don't like it is because you don't understand it. What we need to understand ourselves is no, they don't like it because it's not working, and that's why you know it's it's us that don't understand and not them. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. That was a really Thank interesting you. panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.